How important is our DNA in determining our politics? A lot, says Professor John Hibbing. It even determines who we marry. Political scientist Edward Cottle notes the hypocrisy of American lawmakers who decry the country's relatively low standing in science education, but who pass laws requiring the teaching of evolution. And Bill Press talks with Katie McGinty, candidate for governor of Pennsylvania. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen. Then stand up and fight. Follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Can conservatives moderate their views if only they had more correct information? Nope says Professor John Hibbing, who explains that our political opinions are largely a result of our DNA. And again, we say hello to John Hibbing, political science and psychology professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He is also the co-author of a new book, Predisposed, Liberals, Conservatives, and the Biology of Political Differences. John Hibbing, thanks very much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. I am happy to be with you, Jim. And always nice to have you as well. You know, <laughs> Your book is fascinating, and it says that politics is fundamental to human beings, defining us uh, as a species. Does that mean that politics is literally in our DNA? Well, I think it does. If you think of it from an evolutionary point of view, uh, we are social creatures. It's really what we're good at. It's our competitive advantage to some extent. We don't have particularly sharp claws. Uh, We can't run really fast, but we are really good at forming social units. And so those individuals who are not so good at forming social units have probably been, uh, uh, you know, been at a disadvantage in terms of, of reproducing and, and having their genes in the next generation. So uh, politics in this day and age is really an essential part of social life. We, uh, we've evolved into mass uh, communities rather than, you know, hunter-gatherer societies of 50 or 100 people. And that means we need to have rules in a way that, that is more formal than it might have been in the old style of of living. So politics is structuring social life, and therefore we need to, need to understand how to do that if we're going to have viable social units, which help us as human beings to survive. Mm-hmm. Now, most people would seem to believe that human nature is unchangeable, but that political viewpoints can be changed. You argue just the opposite, though, don't you? Um, kind of. Let me put it just a little bit differently. You know, I, I think political viewpoints are uh, really deeply connected to human nature. That, uh, that was kind of indicative of, in my last answer. Um, but I would also say that this notion of human nature, I think, is, uh, is a little bit misleading. I, I don't think there is a single human nature, and this is part of our notion of predisposition, the title of the book, is that each of us has a different predisposition. We're structured different biologically and genetically, uh, and therefore the notion that humans are violent or not violent or this or that, you know, I really think uh, you need to try to give up on this notion that we're all cut from a, a piece uh, and rather recognize that uh, that we do have have these very different predispositions that lead to very different political notions. Now, you describe the predispositions that we bring to political debates as functions of, of how we experience the world. But certainly education, new experiences, uh, new friends and world events have changed many people's viewpoints. So many of, of so I mean, so many of those communists of the 1930s uh, grew up to be Reagan Republicans, right? Well, I think what you need to recognize is that that these uh, various life experiences that you mentioned, education, uh, new friends, and things like that, those can actually then be manifested biologically. We we take that on board. Some of the things we don't; they just they're kind of like water off a duck. Uh, but a lot of other the experiences really. Uh, then shape us and, and manipulate us. And life experiences have been shown to affect us biologically for a fairly long period of time. So, you know, I think we need to get away from this notion that biology can only be genetic and recognize that, that these things that happen to us uh, throughout a life can really, uh, can really make a difference. One of the ways we like to think of it, and maybe this will help, is that, um, uh, you know, psychologists frequently talk about set points, that people have a happiness set point. So, uh, it turns out that if you win the lottery, uh, you're happier for a few months, but then research has indicated that you really go back to where you were before. Or on the negative side, people who have had amputations, they think their life is over, uh, but then it turns out that six months later they're about as happy as they had been prior to the amputation. 
So, uh, you know, we bounce around in life. Things happen and move us one direction or the other, maybe make us a little more liberal, a little more, more conservative. But all these changes do seem to kind of take place around a kind of basic set point. Uh, and so that's the way we like to think of it. And finally, I might just say that a lot of times we select our friends and our experiences because of our existing predispositions. You know, we're able to kind of move ourselves uh, uh, into these situations. A lot of our friends have similar political views to us. Not always, but, but uh, we do tend to move into those kinds of circles. So I think when you take into consideration those things, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So does all this predispositioning affect how people choose mates and, and thus Definitely. continue to propagate liberals and conservatives? Yes. Yeah. In fact, we've got a, a little paper that we're very proud of about the politics of mate choice. And, uh, you know, outside of a few... Uh, well-publicized cases like James Carville and Mary Madeline, uh, it turns out that there is really a strong tendency for liberals to marry liberals and conservatives to marry uh, conservatives. And, you know, it, given our view of politics as being really deeply embedded into the human condition, uh, this to us isn't, uh, isn't particularly surprising. That could have some kind of disconcerting implications, you know, if we're correct about uh, politics being passed along from, from parents to children. And if, if we have this bifurcation with liberals marrying liberals and conservatives marrying conservatives, then it does suggest that polarization is probably not going to be, to be going away anytime soon. Mm. Now, you say that political differences are not just aired at the dinner table. They have a strong relationship to what is on the dinner table. What do you mean by that? Well, um, uh, political differences are reflected in all kinds of things, including our tastes in food, uh, our um, – sense of, of smell, um, our taste in literature. Conservatives, for example, are uh, much more favorable toward novels that end in a clear resolution. Liberals are a little bit more tolerant of things that might not have that little uh, tidy ribbon uh, tying everything up. Um, conservatives are much more likely to prefer poetry that rhymes. They'd rather eat a favorite dish than try a new and exciting uh, dish. They like a different kind of humor. They like different kinds of art. Uh, they're more uh, favorable toward uh, realism and simplicity in art, whereas liberals are more likely to tolerate abstract art. So anyway, the, uh, the point is there are all kinds of, of differences in tastes and tendencies and, and desires for leisure pursuits. Some of these people or some people think of these as, as uh, stereotypes, but it turns out there is a, a pretty strong uh, statistical basis for them. And, and we document a lot of those things in our book. We're speaking with John Hiving, political science and psychology professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and co-author of a book, along with Kevin Smith and John Alford, Predisposed Liberals, Conservatives and the, uh, pre excuse me, Predisposed Liberals, Conservatives and the Biology of Political Differences. So, John, if something as basic as politics is embedded in our DNA, what hope is there of achieving a more balanced political system? If indeed that would be a good thing. Yeah, here's where the rubber really, really hits the road. And, and uh, you know, I hope I don't lose any of your listeners here because I don't, I don't think they'll like everything I'm about to say. Um, but I, I do think whether you're on the left or the right, we need to take seriously the depth of these things uh, in our opponents. In other words, we need to look at, at those who disagree with us politically a little bit more different, a little bit uh, uh, differently than we do now. Um, I, you know, I think there's a tendency to say, well, if, if they would just listen to the right news, uh, if they just think about these issues, they'd come to the conclusions that we have come to. It, they, these conclusions make so much sense to us. It's difficult to appreciate how different people on the other side are. And that's where this notion of predispositions really uh, comes to the fore. We need to realize that they're paying attention to different things. They experience a different world in many respects. Uh, physiologically, they respond more strongly to negative things. So people on the conservative side are just much more attuned to, uh, to these, these bad things in, in life. And to a lot of liberals, it's, we just think, what, what's wrong with those people? Why? Uh, you know, uh, they see a boogeyman around every corner. Uh, but conservatives look at liberals and say, you know, they just don't get it. And, and so this is very frustrating, but I think we need to recognize that it's not just people listening to the wrong things or not thinking about the issues necessarily. They really are experiencing these different worlds. And we're hopeful, we may be naive about this, but we're hopeful that maybe if people take that on board, they'll be a little bit more tolerant. It doesn't mean you have to say, oh, you know, they're right or I agree with them. You say, they're still wrong, but they're wrong for a, a reason. And We've seen this acceptance of biology become uh, a, a promoter of tolerance in lots of other areas. The big one right now, of course, is sexual orientation. 
those individuals who believe that sexual orientation has a biological basis are much more tolerant of different sexual orientations than those people who think it's all environmental. We have this hope that maybe the same kind of thing can happen with regard to politics. We can be a little bit more tolerant of that other side, recognize that we're not going to argue them, we're not going to persuade them to agree with us, but we are going to need to compromise with them simply because we do come from such different places. Is, is this a, an evolution of the brain, in a sense? Well, um, yeah, you know, I, I think it is. I, I think it's it's the the evolved brain now being applied to a political setting, to, to this issue of, of what rules are going to govern society. Um, and, you know, we're still wrestling with that because our brains are, are in some respects designed for a much simpler setting where we have smaller groups, and now we need to figure out how to make this work in larger groups and in an impersonal situation, and sometimes that can be a, a pretty challenging adjustment. Mm. You know, it, it used to be taught in Political Science 101 that the best predictor of a new voter's party affiliation is how his or her parents voted. Do you think that's still true, and, and, and couldn't that simply just be a case of nurture rather than nature? Yeah, that's good. Two parts to that question. So it turns out that um, the correlation of a parent's political views with the offspring's political views is not very high. Uh, it's around 0.2, which is that means it's closer to not being a relationship at all, closer to zero than it is to one, which would be a perfect relationship. So parents are not all that influential. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting, though, is that that relationship tends to be stronger as those offspring grow into adulthood and then into even old age. In other words, we, this notion of kind of becoming your parents uh, has some, some truth to it with regard to politics. And, and the fact that that happens when we're not being exposed to our parents' views on a daily basis indicates to me that we're really more biologically gravitating toward those, uh, those kinds of areas. So the, the relationship is not that strong, though, when we're, uh, when we're young. And also um, the nature versus nurture uh, issue, you know, that's hard to tease out if you just look at that parent's views and the offspring's views, because the parent has provided both a genetic heritage as well as an environment. And this is why we need to resort to kind of alternative study designs, such as an adoption study, which those are interesting. Does the biological parent's politics affect the offspring's politics, even though that biological parent has not had anything to do with raising and socializing the offspring? Uh, those are the kinds of situations where you can get an answer to those questions. And if you're interested, the answer turns out to be that the biological parent does have an influence on the uh, on the politics of the offspring, even though they've never seen each other. Mm. Fascinating stuff. John Hibbing, political science and psychology professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, co-author of the book, along with Kevin Smith and John Alford, Predisposed, Liberals, Conservatives, and the Biology of Political Differences. John, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again soon. You're most welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. All right. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Professor Edward Caudill says that as a scientific matter, creationism or intelligent design is nonsense, but it doesn't stop a large group of Americans from believing in it. And we'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Medical science has long known that the optic nerve runs from the retina of our eyeballs to the visual cortex of our brains, letting us see what's going on around us. Don't look now, but another optic nerve has evolved. Rather than running to our brains, however, this one goes outward allowing others to see us and also hear us having what we assume to be private, even intimate, conversations. Those others are the out-of-control security agencies in England and the U.S. that are secretly vacuuming up everyone's communications, even though we're not suspected of any illegalities. The Brits took the lead in this latest visual intrusion, giving it the code name of Optic Nerve. They are tapping into the retinas of such Internet applications as Yahoo Webcam Chats, Google Hangouts, and Microsoft Skype. 
Millions of us have these services in our homes and offices, enabling us to have private video talks with someone or some group across town or even around the world. Now we learn, though, that we're not alone. The spooks have hacked into the fiber optic networks of Yahoo and probably others to grab, view, listen to, and store millions of these personal communications. Creepy? Yes, Orwellian level creepy. As Yahoo put it, this represents a whole new level of violation of our users' privacy that is completely unacceptable. Lest you think the spies are only gathering info about terrorist plots, the British agency concedes that up to 11% of the Yahoo webcam images it has purloined contain sexually explicit content. One agent said of the mass window peeping, a surprising number of people use webcam conversations to show intimate parts of their body to the other person. This is Jim Hightower saying, how shocking. Not that they would do that, but that you would be sneaking peeks at them. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy to swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. If we are ever going to make headway against the belief in creationism, progressives are going to have to engage the public in serious science education, says Professor Edward Caudill. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Edward Caudill is a professor of journalism and electronic media at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and the author of a book called Intelligently Designed, How Creationists Built the Campaign Against Evolution. Edward Caudill, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. You're welcome. Now, first, can you explain what creationism is and what intelligent design means, both to its advocate and also in terms of reality? Creationism is invoking God as an explanation for life. Uh, and it's not – it is a – complicated thing in that it has many permutations and combinations. You may be a creationist and believe in millions of years old earth. You may also be a creationist and believe, like the Bishop Usher counted some years ago, that everything was created in 4004 BC. So all of those are creationists. Intelligent design is a scientific sounding term, which without saying so, invokes God, i.e. a designer. So all of them are creationism in some way, shape, or form. Science, by definition, is agnostic. It doesn't invoke God to say, we've run out of answers, therefore God must have done it. Mm -hmm. How has the rhetoric of young earth creationism evolved in the 90 years since the Scopes monkey trial? Well, in the Scopes trial, it was unabashedly literalist. Uh, this was Genesis, just like it said. It's true. There's no variance in that. It's become more nuanced in the time since then, in that now the term that's widely used is intelligent design. This sounds scientific. So... In a way, what's happened is creationism has embraced the language of science, i.e., we have an alternative theory. Uh, it doesn't reject science. In fact, it embraces science, or at least the idea of science. So this has been part of what has been particularly savvy in this 90-year-long campaign is the way – Biblical literalism has been melded so neatly with cultural values, especially the one and in American culture that equates science and technology with progress. So now you can believe in a 6,000-year-old earth, and you can be a scientific, progressive kind of guy, at least in terms of language. Well, it embraces science when it's convenient, it almost seems like. That's true. It does. Yeah. 
Now, your book focuses on the modern American creationism slash evolution debate as a distinctly political issue. That's right. Why is it important to frame the debate in terms of political strategy as well as scientific or religious legitimacy? Well, <laughs> let, let me put it this way. I do believe, just so people know where I'm coming from, that creationism cheapens both science and theology. Uh, it just gets rid of any sort of complexity. But if you look at this as a political debate, it makes sense. If you look at it as a science debate and you want to debate it as a scientific issue, it's nonsense. There is no scientific debate. Uh, but it starts to explain with a very good question, how is it that anywhere from a third to a half of Americans believe this stuff? You start to study the political process, uh, the creation of groups, of communities, and the use of language, and that's where your aha moment comes in. Now I see what's happened, that you say, all I'm doing is saying, be fair in the classroom. Teach alternative points of view. Criticize. Analyze evolution. Uh, be a critical thinker about these things. How can you possibly turn to someone and say, no, let's not do that. Let's not do critical thinking. Let's not teach alternative theories. Well, see, now you're the narrow-minded brute. Mm. Mm -hmm. So why didn't creationism take off as a movement in the United States until the 1920s? I mean, nearly 60 years after On the Origin of Species was published. Well, there was always an undercurrent of objection to Darwin. Uh, or not an undercurrent, I guess it would be an overcurrent, too. But what happens is in the 1910s, you get publication of the fundamentals. It was a series of pamphlets that outlined these basic religious tenets i.e. what we now call fundamentalism, and among them was anti-evolutionism. But the inerrancy of Scripture is what was central to this. Now, anti-evolutionism still do isn't organized, so to speak. But now what we've got in post-World War I America, we've got this guy wandering around who's looking for something to do. His name was William Jennings Bryan. And he leaps to the front of the parade and says, here I am. You've got me. You've got a leader now, the anti-evolution movement. He starts a lecture circuit. He starts publications. He is what's, for lack of a better term, the head of a political action committee, and he's a great one for it. Remember, three-time presidential candidate a guy who has worked in national government, in local government. He's also a newspaper publisher uh, back in Omaha. So this guy is politically savvy. He is media savvy. What a perfect person to have to lead a national movement. And it's evolution because this is something everyone understands in the sense that, do you mean I'm descended from a monkey? And... Yes, that's what we're talking about. Well, I, I say that facetiously. Mm -hmm. But that is something that people can get hold of, get interested in. The larger movement in its origins was actually against the modernists who want to start reading the Bible, among other things. And they have different views of art, literature, history. But they look at the Bible and say, this is more than the Word of God. Let's look at this as history. Let's look at this as great literature. Uh, well, this is just appalling to some people. No, let's not. This is simply the inerrant word of God. Don't try to take that away from us. Well, that's an abstract, pointy-headed, intellectual kind of debate. You're not going to engage people with that. But if you tell people, you know what these guys really mean? They mean that your great-great-great-grandfather was an ape. Okay, now now I understand what you're talking about. Now I got you. Uh -huh. Now we got something to talk about. So William Jennings Bryan crystallizes this whole thing, provides leadership, and voila, we have the anti-evolution movement born in America.
We're speaking with Edward Caudill, a professor of journalism and electronic media at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. His book, Intelligently Designed, How Creationists Built the Campaign Against Evolution. In your book, you appear critical of scientists' efforts or lack of effort to engage the public or to involve themselves in public debate about an issue about which they say there is no scientific controversy. So have scientists failed, so to speak, to answer the challenge from creationists? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> All right. Next question, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> That'll make a lot of friends, won't it? <laughs> but in all seriousness, well, what you have to keep in mind here, again, uh, think of this as a political problem. What do scientists do? Well, obviously, they do science. They're the best in the history of humanity at doing it. That sounds jingoistic on my part, but these American scientists as a group are. They're that good. Do you really want these guys out on the lecture circuit or talking to you guys on the radio? You want them in the lab. This is where they get things done. Their forte is science. But on the other hand, they haven't engaged the public. Uh, They aren't talking to the public. They're right that there's no debate. Well, here's our dilemma again. So what do we do? Uh, It is problematic, but I think they're going to have to engage the public in serious science education if they're ever going to make headway in this debate. Uh, Look at the use of the word theory. Most people don't know what the word theory means. For them, it means the same thing that it did for William Jennings Bryan and it does for every creationist school board in America. It me, it's a synonym for the word guess. How often have you wor- heard the word used to mean that's just your theory of what's going on? Mm-hmm. Or in the context of my theory was that uh, the earth is flat. So, well, that, I'm sorry. That's not what scientists mean by the word theory. They mean a generalization that's empirically grounded. But how many people know that? Yeah, I would guess not many, certainly. Um, a recent survey showed th- that maybe 40% of Americans don't believe in evolution. Right. Does it really matter that so many people are ignorant or, or stuck in their religious belief about evolution? I think it does, because if you're going to be ignorant about one part of science, that means you're going to be ignorant about other parts of science, i.e., global warming. Uh, the and use and of we're vac- seeing that. We're, yes. we're seeing that ignorance. Yes, and say the use of vaccines mm-hmm. uh, and so on. This is harmful to society. This sets us back. Uh, so w- it, there's some irony that we have national and state legislatures fretting about the status of science education in America. And these are the same Uh, folks who every now and then introduce a bill that allows people to teach alternatives to evolution. Hmm. Maybe they ought to try that. (laughs) 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 Edward Caudell, a professor of journalism and electronic media at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, author of the book Intelligently Designed, How Creationists Built the Campaign Against Evolution. Professor, as always, we appreciate your time with us today on americasdemocrats.org and look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press talks with Katie McGinty, candidate for governor of Pennsylvania. Hello, Katie. Good to reconnect with you. Good morning. How are you? Great to hear your voice. Thank you. It's good to hear yours, too. I have to ask you first, because I've lost touch, what have you been up to since the Clinton White House and the Al Gore years? 
and what would qualify you to run for governor of Pennsylvania? Well, listen, I've had a great uh, great privilege and a great fun in terms of private sector and government. Uh, private sector have been uh, involved in investing in renewable energy, clean water projects, uh, both with my friend Al Gore after that interesting uh, and unpredictable end to the 2000 presidential oh, campaign. Oh, boy. Yep. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> um, and then uh, also uh, as a, uh, a leader in a couple of businesses here in Pennsylvania, uh, in the sustainability green energy space. Uh, and in between all of that, I served as Secretary of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania. And no offense to my friends in California, but we kind of uh, <laughs> really got out there and compete and won, and we were number one in the country in wind energy jobs and number two in solar energy jobs when I was secretary. Well, good for you. Well, of course, that's because I had already left California, Katie. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> but no. a little good competition is uh, is terrific. And really, those are the issues, though, that are at the heart of this campaign. I mean, Pennsylvania is a state with incredible assets and resources, but we have fallen under this Republican governor to 48th in the country in job uh, growth and, and dead last in our region in private sector jobs. Really extraordinary performance at a time when the rest of the country is growing and has been on the mend economically. We've really been suffering. You think of Pennsylvania as a state of heavy manufacturing, particularly with the steel industry and everything. Is there great? But is there potential there for renewable energy jobs in Pennsylvania? Well, that was uh, completely my focus when I was secretary in terms of, yeah, we were going to get into the renewable energy game. But in Pennsylvania, yes, people will uh, take action on behalf of the environment, but it always helps if there's a very clear economic upside. So we went out there and attracted the biggest renewable energy manufacturing companies in the world and got them to locate in Pennsylvania. Uh, Gamesa, Spanish wind energy company, literally a thousand manufacturing jobs. And this governor, Governor Corbett, you know, proposes or, or, or puts himself forward as a conservative, yet when it came to supporting tax cuts for wind energy that would have saved a thousand manufacturing jobs in our state, it was all ideology. Nope, can't be for renewable energy, stood against those tax cuts, and we lost hundreds of jobs. So the primary is May 20, correct, Katie? It is indeed five weeks from Tuesday. Oh, man. This <laughs> Not is... that I'm counting. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is crunch time. And you're campaigning today with another good friend, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr.? We are, yes, indeed, and it's uh, a wonderful day. One, just uh, no greater environmental leader than Robert Kennedy Jr., for sure. Uh, but second, a uh, very special day. It's uh, 50 years ago, almost uh, to this month, that uh, uh, Bobby's dad, uh, Robert F. Kennedy uh, Sr., gave his first public speech after the assassination of JFK. Mm. And he gave that speech in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is where we are going. Uh, and, by the way, it was the first public school named for uh, former President uh, Kennedy. Uh, and Bobby uh, uh, Kennedy oversaw that ceremony. And it really was the speech and the event and the outpouring of people's hearts to him that convinced him to jump back into public life. Wow. Well, while you're in Scranton, don't forget to remember Scranton's favorite son, right? Joe Biden. Well, indeed. <laughs> Joe Biden, absolutely. And he still uh, uh, graces us with his, with his presence and always his terrific sense of humor. Yeah. Michael. Yeah, hi, Katie. Michael Tomaski here. First of all, I'm the brother of Susan Tomaski and uh, uh, your old friend, so I'm sure that... Uh... She's a dear friend and has been a great supporter to me in this campaign. Just well, I, I was, was going to ask if she's written you a check. I'm going to see her this weekend, <laughs> and maybe I'll nudge her. Uh, but let me ask you a, a journalistic question, if I may. Uh, 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 the Medicaid uh, money, uh, how big an issue is that in this race, and where does that stand in Pennsylvania? I know that Corbett sort of agreed to take it conditionally. Uh, where does everything stand, and how big an issue is that uh, among the four of you, Democrats? Well, Michael, I really want to press this point hard. Corbett is not at all doing the smart or sensible thing or serving the people of Pennsylvania in his proposal. Uh, he had uh, gotten a lot of pressure for being... Uh, a lone standout against the expansion of Medicaid. I mean, we have a unified voice here 
uh, from those who advocate for the elderly to business uh, interests who have been clear that for Pennsylvania, saying yes to the expansion of Medicaid means 600,000 Pennsylvanians would have health care that don't have it now and a $500 million a year savings to our general fund. So this is one of those issues where it's not to like. Finally, feeling the pressure, um, the governor has proposed something that he calls healthy Pennsylvania. It's nothing of the sort, and really what it amounts to is voucherizing uh, Medicaid, where he'd like mm. to take mm-hmm. federal tax dollars and then say to poor families, you know, here's a couple hundred bucks, good luck going out and negotiating with private uh, insurance companies. I mean, this is a recipe for uh, failed uh, health coverage. We won't have that more expensive health coverage and fewer people covered. So it's, it's not Medicaid at all, and it is really just something that might work for private insurance companies. It certainly doesn't work for the taxpayers of Pennsylvania. And we see this report just yesterday. Surprise, surprise. The states that have opted into Medicaid, the, the rate of uninsured has gone down considerably more than in other states. It's true. And, you know, on the, mm-hmm. on the uh, promising uh, side of things here, Pennsylvania has a thriving life sciences, uh, health care, uh, biotechnology, and medical devices uh, industry. If we had gotten out in front and built our own health care exchange, we could have supported those great businesses in Pennsylvania in designing uh, a health exchange that really maximizes economic opportunity for those good businesses in our uh, in our commonwealth. But we didn't. We've fallen behind there, and so we're left with fewer people covered. We're left with the one-size-fits-all uh, that may not be the best fit for Pennsylvania and our businesses, and we've left a lot of economic opportunity on the table. Well, Katie, it's exciting to see you doing so well. We wish you well. And how, in this critical five weeks coming up, how can uh, our viewers, our listeners all across the country chime in and uh, find out more about your campaign and, most importantly, maybe uh, send, you a little, send a little help your way? What's the best way? Well, I'd be very grateful. Visit me on my website, which is katiemcginty.com, and it's K-A-T-I-E-M-C-G-I-N-T-Y.com. And we'd love to have you join Join the parade. We're on our way to a big victory on May 20th. All right. We will put that link up on our website, Katie. Good luck. Say hello to Robert Kennedy Jr. for us. And uh, Godspeed. Look forward to Thanks good things. Thanks so much. All right. Really appreciate it. All the best now. Bye-bye. K- Katie McGinty. From, she sounds, she's, she's a candidate on yeah. fire. Yeah. Yeah. Go she's get her. Go. Yeah, yeah, she's got it. Katie McGinty. KatieMcGinty.com. A link on our website. That's all for AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. John Hiving, Edward Caudill, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate.